Hi, in this video I'm going to look at what's meant by a data structure. A data structure is simply a way of organizing data and showing how different pieces of data relate to one another. The simplest form of data structure is what's called a single entity data structure. And uh, here I've got five examples. Each of them have their own specific name and in this one I have the value 18, which is what's called an integer in programming environments. And because this value can change, we say that it's variable. So each of these data structures have their own name, and then the value that's inside the data structure, and associated with that is a data type. So this one, the name is price, and its type is real or in some languages that's called a float or a single and it means a value that has a fractional part i.e. numbers after the decimal point there. This one is a single character and the name of that data structure is initial. Here we've got a whole string and at the bottom here we have a boolean variable a data structure that's just going to hold either true or false. And the important, the key thing to this is to remember that these data structures have to be stored in main memory so that we can manipulate them. So here we have those single entity data structures and they're just stored in memory. Now, depending on your computer system or your programming environment, they'll be stored in different ways. So although I've shown the 18 in one single location and the price in one single location, in reality, it's likely that this integer might be given four bytes of storage for storing it. Storing a real number or a float requires storing it with a mantissa and an exponent. So it possibly has eight bytes maybe six bytes for the mantissa and two for the exponent. A single character might be one or two bytes. A string could be 16 bytes. A found, because it's just one of two values, could actually be stored as one single bit, but most often nowadays it's a, a byte of information. Following up from one uh, single entity variables or single entity data structures is the very simple one dimensional array. And this is where you have a situation where you want to group together values under one name. So if you had say a set of prices of items in a shop, rather than having a variable that's price of jam, price of bread, price of toilet rolls, you could just say price, and then you can talk about price one, meaning the price of jam, price two, price three, and so on. And this makes uh, the organization of the data much simpler in that anything you want to do to your prices, like search for a price or update the prices or sort them, you can just do on the one name here, just uh, you can pass across one name to the associated module to carry out the operation and you're not having to pass over masses and masses of individual variables. So the way a lot of programming languages expect you to uh, show the computer system that you're going to use one of these is you have to specify the name of the data structure. You have to say how many elements quite often although live code the one um, that I've been using is it lets you just grow the, the one-dimensional array as you need. And you have to specify the type of data that's going to go in it. So you often get asked this, what are the three things you need to specify about a one-dimensional array? Well, you need to specify the name, how many elements, and what type of elements. And once again, what we're trying to do here is just conceptualize how the data is going to relate to one another and how it can be organized. And the reality is that inside the main memory, 
These values are stored in storage locations, possibly two or four bytes each. And the way the system will refer to them is as age one, age two, age three, and so on. And these square brackets are very often associated with one-dimensional arrays. Following on from that, we often have situations where our data is two-dimensional. So for example, we have here five plants and they're growing over seven days and we're collecting data to do with the height of the plants. So all this data is of the same type. So we have our two dimensions, the same type of data, and so it naturally lends itself to being considered as a two-dimensional array. And once again, I need to specify the name of the data structure. I need to specify the dimensions of the data structure of the two-dimensional array. And I need to specify the type that's of data that's going into the structure. So three things, name, dimensions, and type of data. But the reality of it in main memory is it's still just stored in individual locations and it's up to the computer system to work out how it's going to manage the different indexes into the array structure. So for us, we can consider it as plant height 1, 1, plant height 1, 2, so 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 and so on. Plant height 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3. So this is how we think of the data structure. But the rea reality of it is that the computer system or the programming environment has to figure out some way of putting these into their own or giving them their own storage location so that they're not muddled up in some way. Following on from that, we have what uh, could be considered a three-dimensional array. So, well, fairly obviously you have a dimension that way, that way, and that way. And again, if we're talking about an array um, where we just have simple dimensions on the array, then again, the data type must be the same type. So if this was an array of, well, say we talk about heights again, then if this is a real, 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 all these values inside the data structure, if we're using a three-dimensional array, need to be real values. But again, this is a way for us to visualize how the data is organized and how the data items actually relate to one another. The reality of it is that when they're stored in main memory, we're referring it to as an array name and it, now it has three indexes, maybe um, a horizontal, vertical, and depth. And this is the data item. So maybe one, two, Gregor is sitting in that one there. So this is really for our benefit. And behind the scenes, the programming environment works out where all these are going to be stored. Moving on to a record, this is a type of data structure which allows us to have different types of data in it. So quite often uh, you'll have related pieces of data that are of different types and a very classic example is of a person who often has a forename, a surname which will both be strings and then their age might be an integer, logged in might be true or false and the balance that they have left to pay, I think I was thinking some kind of ba banking situation, the balance that they have left to pay would be a real number. So this is um, sort of a programming language. Um, I have to say what type of structure this is so that I can declare a variable of that type. So in a way, in previous examples, I could talk about an integer or a real or a float or a single. Uh, and the computer system, because they're kind of uh, default types, 
will be able to uh, organize the data. But with something like this, a more complex structure, I need to be able to uh, say that my structure is going to have two strings, an integer, a boolean, and a real. And this is what I'm doing here. I'm saying I'm going to have a type of block of information, which is called a record. So I'm going to have a type of a record with these fields in it. And that type of data is going to be called person data. So this is me sort of inventing something like an integer or a real or a boolean. I've now got a person data. So I'm telling the system I want to create things that are like this. And so I can actually declare a variable person or X or M that is of type person data. So this is like me saying variable X is an integer. Once again, this, inf this sort of structure here is really for us to conceptualize or visualize how our data is organized. The actual reality in main memory is I have to have some way of referring to those different parts. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, this is one way of doing it. Different languages have different ways of doing it. So I refer to the variable person and then to get at the individual fields. This is a bit like Pascal. We use a dot and then we specify the field name afterwards. But I've put this in here so that you um, to show you that ultimately all this data is just in successive storage locations and it's up to the system to work out where it's put things and we'll put data and when we refer to the data using the notation that we've been given in the language the programming environment will be able to work out what that means and actually locate the appropriate piece of information in main memory. Your structures can get more and more complicated. <coughs> Here I've got an array of records. So I declared my person data, my type of structure here. And then I declared an array called person that actually had six elements that were all of that type. So down here you can see I've got variable person is an array of six elements of this type of information that I declared on the previous slide or defined. So again, I need to say what the name of the structure is, person. I need to say how many elements there are. And I need to say what type of information or type of structure each of those elements is. And once again, ultimately, all this data is just in sing uh, their own separate storage location, which may or may not consist of uh, several bytes. But it's just one long list of information, and it's up to the programming environment to uh, store it in a way that makes sense to it and so that when we refer to say person one dot forename it will be able to locate that particular value we can make the uh, arrays more complicated instead of just having a one-dimensional array of records we can have two dimensions so you can see well in fact uh, Here's my array of records. So I'm going to go into um, revenue. I've got my two dimensions here, flat, Glasgow. There the index is flat, Glasgow. And these records have got four fields. So I can talk about the flat in Glasgow and the revenue during Q1, the flat in Glasgow and the revenue in Q2 the flat in Glasgow, revenue Q3. So these are my two dimensions, which make it a two-dimensional array. And this gives me my field name, and that tells me I've got a record structure there. And again, the environment is going to figure out a way of converting that into a specific address in RAM.
Then you have uh, what's called a linked structure. And these are very useful structures. When you have a dynamic situation where your data structure is growing and contracting depending on what's happening in the program. So for example, um, you could have a queue, say you were processing tickets in a, a queue um, to buy, you know, in a box office, then your queue might grow and contract as you manage to process tickets or more people join the queue for tickets. So this is a, a link structure where each element is pointing at the next element in the structure and eventually the structure terminates with the null pointer. And if I wanted to take out of this one here, then all I would do is make this arrow point over and point to the next one and then suddenly this one doesn't really exist. It's busy pointing at that one but it's actually being ignored by all the rest of the structure. And how that would be implemented in terms of RAM is like your, the head is pointing at this element and by pointing I mean that it's the address of that value. And the 16 here, the next value that comes along, the 4004, is the address of the next value, and so on and so forth down the structure, and this is our null pointer at the end. So these linked lists are, are very useful. Um, as I mentioned, a queuing structure. So if I was going to buy tickets, I might join the queue at the tail. And then as tickets get processed from the queue, they would disappear or be taken off from the head. So that's a dynamic data structure. A stack, very common data structure. Um, what we have is a fixed base to the stack. And as things join the stack, the stack pointer moves up. And as they leave the stack, the stack pointer moves down. And the last example I'm going to show is the tree structure. Uh, this is by no means the end of types of data structures, but uh, this is quite a common structure to use in all sorts of situations. And again, uh, what I'm trying to convey here is that the idea of a data structure is a way of representing how data is organized in relation to each other. So this is some kind of directory system, and it's showing you that, say, these folders are within that folder. So we can look at this structure and immediately see that my stuff and private is in this folder, and these are in the home folder. So for us, it's very easy to see how the pieces of data relate to one another. And when it's actually stored inside RAM, Again, it's just stored in storage locations, one after the other, and some of the storage locations will contain the addresses of other values. So, for example, this one here, part of it will be a pointer or an address, a pointer to or an address of that folder. And in here, it will have a pointer or to or an address of that folder, and so on and so forth. So just to conclude, I would say that a data structure is a way of showing the organization of data and how the data elements relate to one another. <laughs>